Good morning. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 15? You'll find your place in verse 33. When I was young, I used to listen to a radio show called Adventures in Odyssey. I don't even know if, okay, so they still have this. And um, there was one episode that I, I remember vividly even now. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a story about a small town where um, these children will go to this place called Wits End, a little ice cream shop and with, with a number of different things to do. And one of the things they have at Wits End is a thing called the Imagination Station. And there's one episode where this boy goes into the Imagination Station and he's, he's transported into a story that he takes part in. And the story he's transported into is the story of Christ's arrest, his death, and his crucifixion. And the way in which they tell that story, it's very compelling, it, it brings you into the narrative. And as I listened, all I kept thinking was, what could we do to stop this from happening? How could we convince these people that uh, what they're doing is an injustice? Or how can we convince Jesus that there's a way out, that you can escape this? And, and the boy in the story is thinking the same thing, and he's, he's trying everything that he can to stop what's about to happen. But as I listened to that, and as I reflected in the years that passed, I realized that what that episode was teaching us was that there wasn't anything that we could do, and in fact, our salvation depended on that exact thing happening, that Christ should go to the cross and die for our sins. And so in the moment, I was so gripped by it and wanted to put an end to this injustice. But reflecting on it and looking back, I realized that my only hope is in that injustice. And so if you found your place, would you follow along with me in Mark chapter 15, verse 33, as we look at the end and the culmination of that very story, and we consider what it was that God did on the cross and why it was that there was nothing that could be done to stop it. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. As we look at this passage, I want you to consider the context in which Israel found itself and, and what many of the people, what their experience would have been at this time in history. You see, they grew up with the law of Moses. They grew up with the temple, going year by year to the temple to offer sacrifices for their sin. I wonder if you've ever asked yourself why it is that we don't go to a temple and we don't offer sacrifices and we don't follow the Mosaic Law in the way that they did. Well, they, that was their experience and the whole experience was designed to communicate certain things, certain true things about God to the people and true things about themselves. It was designed to communicate the holiness of God. The God who says, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy was separated from his people. Even though he was with his people and he was guiding them and he was providing for their needs, there always existed a separation because of sin. And so if you went into the temple, you would have seen curtains that separated different portions of the, of the temple. And parts of the temple, the Holy of Holies and the part outside there, not anyone could just go in there. And especially with the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could go in there once a year to offer sacrifices for all the people. The sacrifices were intended to point to Christ's death. They were intended to communicate the need for repentance. 
This is what they had to do year by year, and it communicated the fact that there was a separation that existed between Israel and their God. And that separation was due to sin. Now we, we know, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know Israel's history of rebellion against God and, and how they failed to keep covenant with Him repeatedly throughout the years. And so all of their sacrifices, even if they were faithful in keeping those sacrifices and, and, and doing the things that the Mosaic Law required, nevertheless there was sin which they had not repented from and, and that created further separation, further estrangement between them and God. So that the prophet Isaiah says that it's not that God, he tells them in Isaiah 59, it's not that God cannot hear you. It's that he does not hear you because your sin has hidden his face from you. Your sin has made a separation between you and God. We oftentimes forget this because we don't have those visible reminders of that fact in our lives. We forget that we too are separated from God by our sin and we need someone to reconcile us to him. We don't have the temple and we don't have the priests and we don't have the sacrifices anymore. What we have, what we see here in this passage is that Christ bridges that gap for us. And so we've skipped over all of the narrative that leads up to this point where Jesus is arrested and he's tried and he's abandoned by his disciples. All of the suffering that he endured at their hands, the injustices they, that he endured, we've skipped over that and we've come to the passage that focuses on what the Father has done here. We see that it begins at the sixth hour. Now that was about noon uh, at that time. Is how they, that's how they recognized this is noon. They said it's the sixth hour had come and for three hours thereafter there was darkness over the entire land. You can, you can imagine how striking that would be to the people. That at noontime, nobody could see that the sun had gone down, if you will, or it was obscured. And there's not really a rational explanation for why this should happen. You can't point to a natural phenomenon that would have caused that darkness. It was clearly an act of God bringing darkness upon the land. The prophet Amos prophesied that God would do that on the day of the Lord, on the day of his judgment, that he would cause the sun to go down at noon. And there's something communicated here. There's an interesting parallel to the Exodus. When you look back in Exodus chapter 10, you see that the ninth plague, the one that immediately precedes the first Passover, is a plague of darkness, where God sent darkness on the land of Egypt, communicating his judgment against that nation. Well, so too, this event occurs at another Passover and God again sends darkness over the land, not communicating judgment against Egypt, but communicating that His Son is enduring His judgment for His people. So, at about three o'clock at the ninth hour, Jesus cries out with that loud voice saying in Aramaic, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They're the words of Psalm 22 that He's quoting here. They indicate that even to the end, there was never a lapse in his faith. He always cried out to the Father as, My God, my God. And yet, it's the cry of one who is seeking a reprieve, seeking someone to intervene on his behalf, and recognizing that he's been forsaken. That God has forsaken, the, the Father has forsaken the Son, and why? He's forsaken him for us. Yesterday, we looked at Mark 10, 45, and we looked at how Jesus said that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. We talked about how the price of that ransom to secure our freedom was his life, and what we're seeing here is a deeper look at what exactly that cost him. It was not just suffering. It was not just the mocking and the spitting, but he was forsaken by the Father for us. He bore the wrath of God for us. That's what we're seeing here in the cross, in Christ's cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What we see in verse 35 is that some of the people who are looking on, they either mistake that what he's saying, the word sounds as though he's crying for Elijah, or they just purposely misinterpret it so that they might have another opportunity to mock him. 
They go and they fill that sponge with sour wine. At first blush, we may look at that and think that they're being kind to him, that he's thirsty and so they'll quench his thirst. But in reality, what they're doing is they're prolonging his time on the cross. They're prolonging his life so that he might suffer more and so that they might mock him and say, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. You see how the people fail to understand what is going on. They look and they, they see an opportunity to mock someone with cruelty. But Elijah won't come. And God won't deliver Christ from that cross. Earlier in the passage, before, before what we've read here, others mocked him, saying, Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they also said, He saved others. He cannot save himself. You see how their mocking ironically communicates a true reality. He does save others. But if he were to save himself, if he were to come down from the cross, all their belief would be meaningless. There's no escape from what Christ endured in this moment on the cross. If he were to come down, if the Father were to deliver him, there would be no hope for us. And so, having seen what it cost Jesus to go to the cross and die for us, let us consider what he accomplished. What is it that he accomplished for us in securing our ransom, our freedom? You see that he utters a loud cry and he breathes his last. Matthew tells us that what he cried out before he died was, It is finished. That what Jesus came to accomplish was finally done. That all the suffering, all the excruciating experience of the cross had accomplished our salvation. And we see that in what happens next. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, Mark does not tell us which curtain in the temple was torn. Some commentators will say that it's the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the remainder of the temple. And if that's the case, then what's communicated here is that we have a new access to God. Before there was a separation, as I had mentioned before, where only the high priest could go in once a year. In fact, when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies to offer his sacrifice, they would tie a rope around his leg just in case there was some impurity and he was struck down and they had to drag him out. So if the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies is what Mark is referring to, then we have a new access to God. That's what this is communicating. And that is true. The author of Hebrews tells us that very thing. But it's also possible that the outer curtain was what was torn in two. And if that's the case, then what's indicated here is that there's an end to the temple and all the rituals that surround the temple and, and the sacrificial system no longer is that the means by which God's people come to Him. There's no need to offer sacrifices year by year. There's no need for continual acts like that because the one and only sufficient sacrifice for sin has been offered. In either case, the same essential point is communicated that our access to the Father is now mediated through the Son. And so what he accomplished for us on the cross, what he secured for us, was our release from sin and our reconciliation to the Father. Notice that the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom, communicating that once more, in another vivid way, what has taken place has been an act of God. No man tore that curtain. It was torn from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. What did he see that caused him to believe, to make that confession? Mark is not exactly clear. He tells us just that the way in which he breathed his last, when the centurion saw that, it led him to confess that Jesus 
this man is the Son of God. But we compare that, this confession of a centurion, of a Gentile, with all of the other things that people said, people who were familiar with God's law and God's word. How they derided him and they said, oh, he's calling to Elijah, let's see if Elijah will save him. He saved others, let's see if he can save himself. All of their mocking and all of their sarcastic remarks, and yet one centurion sees simply in the way in which he died, that he cried out with a loud voice, and he breathed his last. And that led him to confess, truly this man was the Son of God. As we reflect on this week and, and the things that we've learned and the question that we've asked each day, who do you say that Jesus is? We look back and we remember that we saw him healing people, we saw him doing all kinds of miracles, we saw him teaching with great wisdom, and yet always he was pointing to this moment. He was pointing to the moment of the cross, the moment of his crucifixion, when he would die for the sins of his people. And if you go away from this week with one thing in your mind, I want you to go away with this. That when we confess that Jesus is the Christ, if our confession is anything less than a confession of one who suffered and died for our sin, then it's an inadequate confession. It's one that does not recognize him for who he truly is. This is not just a man who died as an example. As the centurion confesses, Pray all these things in Jesus' name.